Yesterday, I was flipping through my wallet to get my ATM card, and I had this kind of funny moment in that I have and keep a hotel room key in my wallet from one of the most diabolical fights that Samantha and I had. It actually was a time when I had almost uh, experienced my appendix bursting. Uh, it was a, a, a nightmare deal, and I got to the ER just in time, was rushed into emergency surgery. So it didn't burst, but it was removed. And then it got infected, which I have heard it happens quite frequently. So my wound had been infected. It was an open wound. It was a difficult time. And Samantha and I get in an enormous fight. This was several years ago. I want to put it around 12 or 13. And she said, I don't want you to stay here. And so it was, it was horrible. Uh, she actually texted me in the middle of the night to say, I forgot about the wound. I forgot about the infection. If you need to come home, there's a key under the mat. And big tough guy said, no, I don't need a key. I will be fine in the Holiday Inn Express. And I came home the next day. Uh, the fight continued, but we eventually made up. It was a significant moment. I keep that hotel room key in my wallet to remind me of what I never want to go back to. I keep it as a reminder of what my choices have done to me and to Samantha and to my life. It can seem a little bit counterintuitive that for someone who talks about infidelity almost literally every day of his life, whether it be in videos or helping people or what have you, that I would need any sort of reminder. But the reality is, is that I do. I carry that hotel room key as a reminder of what I'm capable of, as a reminder of what my choices did to Samantha, to my family, and how it cost me so much. I have it there as... I probably find it every other week or so, and it just kind of centers me and says, ooh, I remember that. That doesn't discourage me. And I, I use this example because I think a lot of people go through recovery trying to not think about what they've done, trying to not think about it, put it behind them, and move forward, and I respect that. The problem is it doesn't really work because for a short season, somewhere between two weeks and as much as maybe a year or two, I think you, and maybe actually longer, you have to remind yourself as an unfaithful spouse of what you're capable of, of what your choices can do to your family, to your spouse or partner, or to yourself. So I keep that card, and it, it really kind of punches me every time I look at it. I remember... The night, I remember how painful it was having to come home and humble myself in the kitchen with Samantha and, and really work through a few hours of some really difficult conversation. I remember the kind of arrogant, insecure guy that I was back then. And so it isn't about how time heals all wounds. I don't believe that. It's what you do with the time that actually matters. And when I, when I see that hotel room key, there is a shiver that goes up my spine. But I'm not running from that. And I want to encourage you today. Maybe you're early on. Maybe you're starting to gain some momentum. Maybe you need to keep a few reminders that will help you realize what you're capable of. Because so many people think, look, I'm forgiven by God, or I've forgiven myself. I don't need to think about this again. I don't need to focus on it. That's a lie. Because if you don't focus on it, you forget what you're capable of. And so I, I keep that card. Because it, it helps me, I feel a punch that makes me go, hmm, I don't want to ever go back there. And I, I want to give you a few things, a few nuances, a few uh, reminders, if you will, to help you stay focused on recovery. These suggestions that I'm going to make are actually for both of you, unfaithful and betrayed. They'll just look different in how they play out. But so many of us spend our time running away from the pain or pretending it didn't happen or not focusing on it, that we miss the opportunity to be proactive. We miss the opportunity to be courageous and 
humble and actually own what we've done or own what we feel and we miss a chance to really kind of win our spouse's heart a little bit at a time. Because if you spend your time just running away from this, you're missing golden opportunities and moments to experience healing. So I hope you'll try a few of these things because I'm confident they will help you whether you're unfaithful or betrayed because I know they've helped Samantha and I. If you're an unfaithful spouse, one of the best things that you can do is lean in to what your betrayed spouse is feeling. So often we want to run away from it. Our guilt and our shame cause us to shut down. We stonewall. Oh, I don't want to hear it. Do we have to keep talking about this? I don't know that you're any more courageous or any stronger or braver than when you lean into what your spouse is feeling and say, you know, how can I help you right now? What can I do right now? I'm not going to shut down. I'm not going to run away. I'm not going to pretend this didn't happen. I'm not going to get defensive and judgmental. I'm just going to lean in and say, man, you're probably having a difficult day or that probably really hurts you because of what I did. When you do moments like that, you are leaning in to the pain that your victim is feeling. It is revolutionary when you don't get defensive or 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 blame shift or any of that, you just lean in and say, well, what are you feeling? I mean, what does that say to you? And you don't try and fix them. You just lean in, which leads me to the next point, which is sitting with the pain. Now, this plays out a few different ways. I've had to sit with childhood trauma. I've had to sit with pain that I've caused in Samantha's life and thousands of others when my affair became public. There's a moment where I think you have to sit with your pain because we spend so much time running away from our pain, unfaithful and betrayed. One of the most, I think, life-changing things to do is actually sit with your pain and process through it. Process what your choices have done to your spouse. Process what your choices have done to you. Don't let it lie to you and deceive you into thinking life is over, you're no good, you're just a worthless this or that. But as you are being proactive in your recovery, you're going to learn that you have to sit with your pain and hurt. Whether it's the pain that you've caused or the pain that's been done to you, you're going to have to sit with it and process through it. Another step that you can take is to be proactive. You see, oftentimes we don't want to talk about pain or hurt or marriage difficulty unless it happens and then we go, crap, now i got to deal with this. One of the most liberating and courageous things you can do maritally is to be proactive and to actually say, what do you think, honey, about doing this book or reading this book or getting together once or twice a week and engaging in conversation about X, Y, or Z, doing the boot camp that is on the website. Also, if you've just... uh, maybe come to an awareness that we are doing a one-day betrayed spouses seminar called Hope Rising. It's on the website. You can Google it. You can find it on Twitter, but it's for betrayed spouses only. It's one day here in Austin in October. Be proactive. Come to it or watch it online. But it's things like that that you have to kind of get up and say, you know what? I don't want to. I don't feel like it, but I'm going to be proactive because it's the right thing to do because I know. I know that there is a tendency and an inclination to run from the pain, kind of stuff it away, compartmentalize it, and you feel this kind of false momentum, right? Like things are going well. I haven't had to talk about infidelity or addiction or this or that for a few days. And you feel like, yeah, there's so much great momentum. Things are going great. And then out of nowhere, bam, you feel crushed with a reminder, a trigger, or new information or something. And all the momentum that you felt like you had has been ripped away. When momentum is purely from denying your reality or when momentum is purely from pretending that you don't feel the pain and the emotion and the feelings that you're feeling, it's not real because it can be upended with one thought, one reminder, one trigger, one difficult conversation. But as you're proactive, you're actually gaining momentum and the momentum is far more real even though it is a struggle and even though you feel like, man, I don't even like talking about this stuff. You're gaining more momentum that way than you are running away from the pain and being unwilling to talk about it. Because there's really seasons. There's seasons where 
you'll have some difficult conversations, you'll gain some momentum, and things are going well. And then you're not living in denial, you're not refusing to talk about it, but then, boom, you hit this next level of, I didn't even know this pain was here, and I didn't even know this hurt was here, and I thought we had momentum. You did have momentum, but you are about to go to another level in your recovery, and if you don't confront this pain, this hurt, these re reminders, these triggers, these things that you didn't even know that were there, you're not going to be able to get to the next level. Because until you can conquer and confront the next level of pain or hurt or forgiveness, you won't go to the next level and you won't get 10 or 12 or 14 years or 20 years down the road. Sometimes the difficulty that comes after a season of momentum is actually not because you were in denial, it's because you got healthier. And I firmly believe as we get healthier, our perspective becomes clearer and we see things differently and we see them with greater clarity. The unfortunate reality is sometimes greater clarity means, wait a minute, that is wrong. That's dysfunctional. I have to confront that. Crap, that sucks. I don't want to do this. Things have been going well. But you have so much more of a healthy perspective. You're able to say, but we have to, and we're going to, and we're going to get the right help. And then you deal with it, and what you thought was going to take this long season of time took a short season of time, and now you've got even more momentum. I hope that you don't live your early recovery just hoping that the pain and the hurt and the turmoil will go away. It's not going away. You're going to have to confront it. As you confront it, and as you're proactive, and as you lean in, and as you actually sit with the pain and the hurt and the trauma, I promise you, it gets easier. You get better. You get stronger. Joy will start to come back to you, but you're going to have to be willing to lean into what you're feeling and push through it with the right help and the right perspective. Because I promise you, your life is not over. The greatness of your life is not done. The potential of your life is not squashed forever, but it's what you do in this moment that will determine the next few years and decades of your life. Thank you.